Good evening, creep. Tonight's mystery playhouse story is entitled Mathematics of Murder. You know, it reminds me of a conversation I had recently with a friend of mine who's a detective. He said that some of those mystery writers and their perfect crimes handed him a laugh. He said the only reason those crimes are perfect is because the detectives in the stories are such fools. And he claimed that 95% of those crimes could be solved by any detective with just a little routine legwork. Well, creeps in tonight's play are going to meet that kind of a detective, namely, a leg man. Listen now to Mathematics of Murder. <laughs> This is the story of two men. Two men who have never met. Two men who move in different worlds. Two men who have never even heard of one another and who certainly never expected to... But let's not get ahead of ourselves. After all, that's the story. Just now, they are two utter strangers, each with something quite different on his mind. No. No, don't. I'll make good. I'll pay. I've told you that already, only I can't this minute. I haven't got that much right now. I know, I know you've given me plenty of time already, only... Look, I tell you what. Let me call you back. Well, I'll try some more. There must be someone who... Well, how much time can I have? No, no, I'm not stalling. This is on the level. Yes, I'm sure of getting it. It's as good as mine now, only I need a little time to collect it, that's all. Yes, of course, I'm sure. This is the payoff. Well, I know how I can get it now. I'm sure, I tell you, I... I'm dead sure. That was Colin Hughes. Remember that name, Colin Hughes. And now this is a man he's never met or heard of. An utter stranger. A man as remote from Colin Hughes' life as the Bronx from Lower Central Park West. Sam Evans, a man with something quite different on his mind. Yeah, sure, why not? Let's ask him for dinner Friday night. You know, I'm always saying, yeah, only you should taste my missus' borscht and cheese blunches. Then you'll really taste something. Yeah, that's what I tell him. And it's the truth. Two men, two strangers, each going his own way, each quite oblivious of the other. Colin Hughes and Sam Evans. <laughs> Oh. I didn't expect you tonight. You said I just you... wanted to tell you I'd be over to see you tomorrow night. Oh, that's swell, Colin. Only you come over and see me nearly every night. Well, so I just I... wanted to tell you that's all, Myra. Uh, why not ask some people in? But you always like it best when we're by ourselves. Well, this time I feel like having some people around for change. Say, by the way, how often do you wind that clock? Oh, uh, it's an eight-day clock. Oh? Oh, well, uh, should I wind it now? Well, it's not due for six more days. I did a day before yesterday. Oh, darn it all. What's the matter, Colin? I think I left the lights on in the car. Would you mind having a look from the hall window? Why, sure, Colin. Thanks. Now to change that clock. There. No, you... You turned them off all right. Oh, fine. Well... Take off your hat and stay a while. No, I'm going now. Already? Mm-hmm. Colin, where are you taking that radio? Oh, to the repair shop. I think it needs new tubes. Yeah, but won't we need it for the party? It plays good enough the way it is. Well, we'll play records or something. I'll be around tomorrow at 8. Colin, you're acting so strangely this evening. At 8, I said. I heard you, Colin. You'll be over tomorrow night at 8. Is there anything remarkable about that? <laughs> The only remarkable thing about Colin's date was that he was a bit late in keeping it. For well, the next evening at eight, he was behind the wheel of a car rolling smoothly along a lonely highway. I must say you look charming, Maureen. Thank you, Colin. It's been a long time since I've heard you say something like that. <laughs> it's still nice to get compliments from one's husband, even a divorced one. How have things been going with you, Colin? Oh, well enough. I don't have to ask you. 
Everyone says you're the big lady executive these days. Oh, not really. Well, I could never have bought you a silver fox like that. Oh, don't worry. I'm not going to ask how much it costs. Well, that's one thing to be said for being divorced. We don't have to quarrel about money anymore. <laughs> well, it was my fault, really. And you being such a success. Oh, Colin. But let's not go into that. We're having much too nice a time. I can't tell you how surprised I was when you phoned. And so pleased. It seems so gay coming out here to meet you. I was like a schoolgirl on the first date. It's been so long, Colin. Yes, it has, rather. New car, Colin? How long have you had it? Oh, a while. Very nice. I guess you're not doing too badly yourself. Oh, the devil. What is it? It's these lights. I had the car in the garage just today to be fixed. When I touch the dimmer button, they seem to go out completely. At least I think so. Well, maybe there's a bulb loose. Well, I better have a look. You see, when I touch this, it's supposed to deflect the lights. But if they really go out, someone could easily plow into us. Maureen, would you mind awfully? Maybe it's just one of them. Of course, Colin. What shall I do? Well, I was wondering if you'd just step in front of the car and tell me what happens when I press the button. Which light is gone? See if it's the right. I don't mind so much. Of course. Here, wait. I'll get the door for you. There. They should both be on now. Yes, they are. All right, now stay there and watch when I... Colin, you're sliding. Colin! It's sure. Yeah, okay, okay. Think they let even a cop get a little sleep sometime. Hello? Yeah, speaking. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. Woman got killed in an accident. You figure it's just another hit and run, but you want me to have a look anyway. Okay, I'll be right out there. Well, there she is, Inspector. Gosh. Dead when they found her, Clancy? Yeah. Well dressed, huh? Yeah, you don't get silver fox for peanuts. Nice looking woman, too. Ah, these hit and run drivers. Yeah. I guess she must have stepped into the road. Probably didn't even look where she was going. Maybe. Something coming along hits her, then the driver gets panicky and runs off. Maybe. Accident, all right. Hit and run. Maybe. You mean you Maybe don't... it was an accident. On the other hand, maybe not. <laughs> Yes? Well, Mr. Hughes, I'm Inspector Evans. Oh, I don't believe oh, I... Oh, uh, here's my badge. I'm uh, afraid i got to ask you a few questions. Come in. Thanks. I uh, guess you know your former wife is dead. Yes, I I read it in the papers. When was the last time you saw him? Oh, in the judge's chambers just about a year ago, the day we were handed down our decree. We shook hands, wished each other luck, and that was that. Huh? Uh, how was she fixed financially? Good, I suppose. She had a big department store job. I suppose you know you were named beneficiary on her insurance. No, I didn't. How much is it for? I don't know anything about that. You'll have to take it up with them. Oh. Uh, look, would you give me the dates of your marriage from when to when? Yes, of course. 1940 to 1943. The insurance was taken out in 1942. You were married to her then. How is it you didn't know you were the beneficiary? I... So you were lying, huh? You did know you were the beneficiary. I did know then. You didn't understand what I meant. I didn't know I was still the beneficiary. I thought she changed it since. As a matter of fact, I assumed she had. Oh. Anything the matter, Evans? No. No, only that that was just the wrong answer, see? <laughs> Strangers no longer. One man a murderer, the other a man with a good hunch. Sure, you know, of course, but not the little man from the Bronx. He only has a hunch and a way of getting the wrong answers. He couldn't possibly know yet.
But is he in trouble? What'd he do? Oh, no, no, he is in trouble, Miss Carlson. He didn't do anything. Just a checkup. Doesn't mean anything. Don't let it bother you. Uh, Mr. Hughes was over here last night with you, is that right? Yeah, he was. Just the two of you by yourselves? No, we had some others, a party like. Well, what was it in celebration of? I don't know. Well, who got it up? Well, I guess it just got itself up. Oh, who was at it? Oh, nobody much. My sister and her husband, uh, the couple next door, that's about all. Oh, I see. Well, I, uh, I may be back. Uh, don't be frightened. I usually forget things I want to ask the first time and have to come back and ask them the second time. I'm not very good that way. Gee, I suppose he was doing the best he could, but he acted like he didn't know what it was all about. They must take anybody on the detective division these days. You're listening to the Mole Mystery Theater on When Radio Was. We'll be right back. And now let's get back to the episode Mathematics for Murder on When Radio Was. Sure, Inspector, I was at the party Nyra gave for Colin. My sister and I were going to the movies. It was the last night for Jean Arthur, but Nyra just insisted, and we didn't have the heart to turn her down. She seemed so set on it. I guess we were there from about 7.30 to 12. <laughs> Yes, that's right, Inspector. We were there. We turned Nyra down the first time she called. I didn't want to go. I'm pretty tired these days from working and all. But Nyra just wouldn't take no for an answer, so the second time she called, we gave it and went. Oh, hello, Miss Carson. Oh, hello. I guess you did forget something the first time you was here, like you said. Yeah. Uh, come in. Oh, thanks. Uh, about that party, Miss Carlson, uh, who suggested having it? You or you? Oh, it was between the both of us, I guess. Well, what time did you call him about coming over? Oh, I didn't. He just came. Yeah, but he brought an armful of records in with him, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Then if you didn't call him, how'd he know enough to bring records to the party? Well, I... Uh... Okay. What did I, uh, did I ask you who first spoke of having the party? He or you? Well, I guess he did say something the night before. Then I did the calling, so it was like between the two of us, you might say. Oh, I see. Uh, what time did you get here? Oh, it was about eight. Well, how'd you know? It was on the clock, that's how I know. Well, what made you look at the clock? Well, he came in and said, everybody here already? What am I, late? So I looked. You know how you look when somebody says something like that? Yeah, I know how you look when somebody says something like that. I guess he took the other girl home first. What? Well, what other girl? You know, the one he had out in the car with him. Out in his car? Yeah. Well, I guess that's all. Do I have to answer any more of your questions? No, not a one. Mister? Yeah? Mister? I forgot to tell you. Yes? That clock was an hour slow. He got here at eight by my clock. But everywhere else, it was nine. This here is Hughes's car. He's kept it in this garage over a year. Has there been any cleaning done on it? No, just bedded down for the night. Well, hold this light, will you? I'm going to have a look at the tire treads. Sure. What's up, mister? I ask him, you answer him. Uh, how long is this car been in? Oh, I got the ticket here. Let's see here. He brought it back at 11.45. You sure, then? Right here in the car. Before that, when did he take it out? Uh, 10 to 9. 10 to 9? That's right. Definitely. Yeah. What's the matter, mister? It was a wrong answer. All right. And he didn't lose his own car. <laughs> Well, I guess there's nothing to do but go down the road. Thanks. You know what? Are you the manager of Monarch Auto Rentals? Yes. That car out there is impounded. Don't let anyone go near it till I can send someone over to you. 
What's the matter with it? There's nothing to find on it just now. A silver fox hair on the back of a seat. Who rented this car? I'm Mr. Joe Miller. What kind of credentials did he have? Well, uh, you mean you rent cars without security? Ooh, ordinarily, no, sir. But uh, he left a large deposit, enough to cover the whole car. Mr. Sabin? Surely. Mr. Uh, stout, stout man. He's 50. He's 50? What's the matter, sir? Nice shot. Okay. Seven ball in the corner pocket. Here's hey, what I say. What's the idea of grabbing my arm that way? You could have ruined my shot. Take off your eye, Kate, and come outside. I want to talk to you. Scram, I'm going to finish this game, see? You have already. Come on out. I don't see this why. This piece of tin says do it. A detective? Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, excuse me, fellas. All right, your name's Flynn. Last night, you rented a car from Monarch under the name of Joe Miller. What'd you do with it, and where'd you go? I don't have to okay, tell you. Okay, you don't have to. You're under arrest for murder, then. Come on. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute. I never murdered anyone. I... The car's a murder car. Murder? Look, look, this, it wasn't me. I wasn't in it. I just took it out for somebody else. I... Oh, now you're telling it, huh? Yeah, now I'm telling it. I was clean out playing some of the fellas back there, and I come out for a breath of air. And then this fella comes by and asks me if I had care to do him a favor. I said there's 20 bucks in it for me. And you were willing. I wanted to get back in that game. After all, 20 bucks, 20 bucks. What was the favor? Take a car out for money. Under a fake name, not my own, of course. Fine. Well, so I took it out for him, and I, I just drove around the corner and picked him up. And he dropped me off at the pool room. There was still half of the 20 coming to me, so about quarter to nine. Quarter to nine? Yeah, quarter to nine. I went outside and met him again. Like we'd ring. He showed right on time. I took the car back for him and reclaimed the deposit. And you gave that back to him? Here... She wasn't there no more. I, I don't know what happened to him. I couldn't find him. Yeah. You think you're telling a lie, but you're not. Huh? He wasn't there anymore. He didn't wait. Only you didn't go back to look for him. Even if you had, though, you wouldn't have found him. Yeah, it's a smart play. I figured you'd walk off with the money. It was the best guarantee in the world that you'd stay out of sight and keep your mouth shut from then on. Yep. Cheap at that time. I, I know it sounds phony, but you'll have to believe me. <laughs> no, I don't have to, but... So happens, I do. That's him. That's him, I tell you. The tall guy just went in there. Now, that's the guy that came up I, to I me. I know, friend. Don't you believe me? That's him. That's the guy. Known that all along. Ain't you going over there, man? No, it would only be your word against his. Uh, what do you to do with me. Look, you got 20 bucks for getting out of that car the other night. How'd you like to get another 20 for staying in it? All the way to wherever it went and back. I, I don't think so. You don't have to. You get the 20 bucks. And I'll get a murderer. Officer. Yes, sir? Uh, my name is Hughes, officer. Colin Hughes. I had this message. Inspector Evans asked if it was convenient for me to drop down here and... Right this way, sir. Oh, thank you. Sure, I can't imagine why he wanted to see... Right in here, Mr. Hughes. Oh. Oh, Mr. Hughes. Now, would you? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mr. Hughes, uh, we'd like your help. We're holding a suspect. Suspect? In what? In the murder of your wife, Mr. Hughes. Murder? Mm -hmm. I thought it was a hit-and-run driver. Nope, it was premeditated murder. We've got the man dead to rights. Oh, you have? Yeah, we've been pushing him around all day, and he's just about right to break down and confess. Oh, well, that's fast work, Mr. Evans. No, slow. You could have arrested him six hours after a death. You could? Yeah, but I uh, had to wait for proof. 
But uh, how did you know it was murder and not an accident? Well, you know, they always think they've got to be so careful. If your wife's killer had only been a little careless now. What do you mean? Well, put yourself in a killer's place. What? Of course, I, I know you're not the type. <laughs> no, I, I hardly think so. You see, there were tread marks on your wife's fur cape. Trouble was, there were tread marks on her, too, underneath the fur cape. The killer must have run over her when she wasn't wearing the cape. But he was so bent on making it look like an accident, he ran over the cape and then put it on her. Yeah, he fixed it so it couldn't be anything else but murder. Just wouldn't leave well enough alone. But, uh, Mr. Evans, how can I help? Why did you call me? Well, the killers try to involve you. Me? Why, uh, how? Let me explain. Your wife met a death at approximately 8.20 that night while you were with some friends at a party. Yes. Uh, we checked that, Mr. Hughes. No offense, but you understand we have to check everything. Naturally. We also know that you accepted a lift from a stranger for several blocks from Mercer Street on your way over to your girl's house. But uh, we I... checked on that, too. Now, you wouldn't believe such a ghastly coincidence, but that car and that stranger are responsible for your wife's death. Good heavens. Now, we know that you weren't in any car at 820, so all you have to do is tell us at what point you left the car, so we can establish from what point on he took over the car alone. Uh, any objection to helping us steam that out of it? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. Fine. You do that, and I promise you won't be held as a material witness. He'll confess. Uh, now, where did you get out of the car? At Market Street. Market Street. Yeah. Thanks. Right. All right. Bring him in. You there, Mr. Flynn? <laughs> Flynn, did you ever see this gentleman before? <laughs> He's the one that got in the car with me at first. For the last time, where did he get out again? <laughs> he didn't. He rode all the way. He came up to me and had me hired it. You're a liar, Flynn. He's got a car of his own. I mean, I gave him a lift and he rode out all You're the way. You're still lying, Flynn. Well, Mr. Hughes, uh, at what point did you step out of the car? Market Street. I see. Now, you have no objection to signing this statement to that effect, have you? Is there a point of evidence? No, no, none whatever. Now, look, he's got out. Uh, I rode in the car bearing the license number 908-761 between Mercer Street and Market Street on the night of April 30th. Uh, just now. Very well. Thank you. You can go now. Oh, thank you, Inspector. No, I mean Flynn. What? But you said I wouldn't be held as a witness. You won't be. You're being held for murder. What? Oh, but there must be some mistake. Dude, huh? you admitted you were in that car. I found a dozen witnesses who testified that Flynn was out of it from eight till nearly nine in a pool room. But my girl, I, I was with her at eight. You got there at nine. No, I... See, all I had to do was get you into that car. The rest is just a matter of subtraction. Two men in a car from Mercer to Market Street. Take one out. The car goes ahead and kills your wife. Now, wait a minute. Got wait a minute. The one who stayed in was the one who killed her. Flynn can prove he got out of the car and you can't. That leaves you. Why, that's not... No, it I... isn't. That's mathematics. Subtract one man from two men in a dust car and you've got the murderer. Yeah, you might sort of call it the mathematics of murder. This is the Armed Forces Radio Station.